physics and theory of neurobiology. So some, some of them are of an outside perspective on curiosity. I'm also going to follow Richard Feynman's philosophy that if you want to understand something, you've got to be able to make one or create one. So I've created some curious machines in order to understand the nature of curiosity. I'm going to show two of them to you. One's very trivial, um, it could be construed as a curious rat searching for stuff. And then the second one goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. It's um, an attempt to build an agent that solves problems. Uh, and solves problems that are sufficiently interesting and hard that they do reveal some of the different issues about epistemic origin and inference. Uh, and hopefully, if we have time, I'm going to ask you, the audience, to sort of try and solve the problem, play the game that the agent is going to play, and we'll see if you're better or worse than this space option later. That's if we have time, but I assume you'll give me a, a shout when I'm approaching about 10 minutes before the end. So, my talk is, um, I, I've got lots that I would like to say. There are a few important things and more or less important things. So I'm going to speed over the things that are less important and just focus on things that I think um, deserve discussion or deliberation. <coughs> I'm going to talk about um, the general principle, action, and the uh, resistance, the importance of generative models or active uh, uh, inference. So, I normally start this lecture um, by asking you to imagine that you're a mouth and you're hungry. So, what are you going to do? Any answers? What would you do? Could you say? Fly around. Fly around. Why would you do that? To get uh, an idea of where I can find food. To get an idea of where the food is. Exactly. So, just using that simple um, observation, the first thing you do when confronted with a situation is resolve your uncertainty about how to act next. So I'm going to use that as a premise. In fact, I'm going to use that simple observation that the first thing you do when behaving or choosing your next move is to um, resolve uncertainty, identify the location of the prey in this instance. I'm going to use that to build a dichotomy. A dichotomy between pragmatic or extrinsic value and epistemic value, intrinsic motivation. Um, and I'm deliberately creating a dichotomy and I'm going to dissolve the dichotomy. I'm going to dissolve it by putting reward or pragmatics or utility into a functional that's all about epistemics and beliefs. And in that dissolution, different sorts of expected surprise and certainty will be revealed. And hopefully, you will recognize the sorts of behaviors that are responsible for minimizing those different aspects of uncertainty. And I'm hoping that Peter Dayan is going to tell formally exactly the same story. But I suspect he'll do it in a complementary way by absorbing the epistemics into a function. But we're both of us in the game of trying to understand the interplay between the pragmatic and the epistemic components and the imperatives for the good ways to behave. So I've cartooned up here actually in terms of the distinction between selecting an action, a policy that maximizes some value function of the next state that will obtain a particular action. And then that will be my policy, which is the best thing to do from any current state that maximizes the value of the uh, series. Uh, however, 
when we just said that the first thing that we do in terms of choosing behavior is to reduce uncertainty. And uncertainty is an attribute of a belief. And in my world, a belief would be a probability distribution. Therefore, we know that the thing that needs to be optimized is not a function of states, but a function of the needs of our states that have been denoted by Q here, given some action. So that's the first thing that, we, um, that this example tells us, that we want to find a loop that optimizes the function of beliefs. The second thing it tells us is that the order matters. It matters whether I search for food and then eat it, or I try to eat it and then search for it. So what I'm saying simply is we have to optimize the sequence of actions and the associated path integral or trajectory or average or expectation of the function over time. If I write that formally, then if I associate this energy function here, um, uh, or if I associate that function with an energy, then the sum of an energy over time is an action. So all I'm doing is really reiterating Hamilton's principle of least action. So the dialectic that I'm introducing is you can either go with Delvin's optimality principle and try to optimize the value function and the uh, and policies that can result from that value function, or you can go with Hamilton's principle of least action. And these have a lot of different flavors in them. Uh, so Delvin's optimality principle would be a lot control theory. Whereas if we go with Hunter's principle of least action, we're in the world of active influence, active learning, artificial curiosity, choosing motivation, and so on and so forth. Uh, partially observed and belief state, mark of decision processes. So that's the deliberate divide I'm introducing, and now we're going to try and put them back together. And the way that we're going to do that is by appealing to one principle, the principle that everything that we do, everything that we believe is in service of minimizing surprise or surprise, uh, and more particularly uh, a lower barrier of surprise, which uh, I'm going to refer to as variation of free energy. Furthermore, I'm going to assume that it is the case that to behave optimally, I have to believe that my behaviors will minimize the expected free energy as a result of my behavior. Uh, so, what does that mean? Well, if I can write down my beliefs about behavior in terms of an expected free energy, which I can call G here. Yeah. I'm going to have to. Uh, um, so, the probability of a policy high comprises the sequence of actions is going to be now a an action of this free energy, where this free energy has the normal terms in it. Uh, this is an energy term, this is an entropy term. Don't worry about the maths. Uh, I'm going to unpack the maths for you and hopefully get you to a uh, place that uh, I'm using words and concepts that are very familiar. Um, I've just unpacked this um, uh, energy term here into a, uh, a, a light field prior here. And I've rearranged it. And I've rearranged it in a way um, that starts to make sense of this distinction between the extrinsic value and the intrinsic value uh, in this instance um, uh, information here. So let me try and look at that equation and uh, eliminate certain parts of it to see how we can interpret it. Now the first thing I'm going to eliminate are, are the, um, these prior preferences, these prior, not prior preferences about outcomes given I eliminate that, then I'm left with this expected basis prize of um, K out of divergence here that basically scores the difference in my beliefs about the world before and after observing outcomes that are consequent to my behavior. Um, that quantity is uh, mathematically the basis surprise that would be very familiar for many of you working in. Uh, visual salience and searches. This is the quantity that creates a salience map that determines where to look next. Interestingly, this expression 
this expected KL divergence is also the mutual information between the causes of outcomes and the outcomes themselves. So it's, a, it's also an expression of uh, the principle of maximum uh, mutual information, the minimum redundancy principle, the principle of maximum efficiency, as articulated by people like Horace Barlow. Uh, what I'm going to do now is put these applied preferences back into the game and consider another special case. And another special case is when we can remove any uncertainty about the state that I'm observing. So I'm going to take ambiguity out of the equation so that I can be able to directly observe states. And in that instance, the S's become the O's, so the state of the observation become identical. And I now will focus on uh, this <coughs> is a systemic uh, part here, um, and this now becomes a simple divergence between the outcomes that I predict and the outcomes of a priori that I prefer. And that's known in, in engineering as uh, KL, that's optimal control. In economics, it's risk sensitive control. Um, of course, if you are a physiologist, then uh, you would simply associate that with things like. So, the, um, the next simplification is a, um, putting the, um, the prior, the prior, the prior preferences in place, but now eliminating the uh, risk and the ambiguity. So I'm taking up all uncertainty off the table, because what we're left with is simply the expected probability of our preferred outcomes. If I associate that one probability with uh, value, then we simply have expected value. So all of these things hopefully will be familiar to you. Um, I should also mention there's one more thing that I can do here. I can remove um, all the um, preferences, I can remove all the ambiguity about hidden states, uh, or causes, or outcomes, and see what's left. And what's left is just the uncertainty of my beliefs about the future. Um, which means that if I have no preferences um, and there is no epistemic value yet to be obtained from the world, then the best thing to do would be to simply keep my options open. And that's sometimes uh, described in terms of James's maximum attention principle. So, if it is a case that we can um, articulate good behaviour and understand all its um, special cases in terms of this one notion of choosing behaviours that minimise expected free energy, it would be therefore necessary to specify the generative models under which I'm going to evaluate my free energy. Um, so I'm going to just introduce a very simple model, um, probably the most simple model that one can imagine, uh, a Markov model or a um, Markov decision process, just to put some flesh into the optimization scheme and then use that to simulate a active agent. So this is a very simple model where we have states of the world that involve uh, transitive transition matrices in case of ID here, and each state generates an outcome here. There's a mapping between the states and the outcomes denoted by uh, a likelihood matrix A here. And these transition matrices depend upon the actions or policies that I adopt. And these are the cells around the variables that I have to infer. Uh, these influences uh, are more or less confident. I'm introducing here a temperature, temperature or precision parameter here that scales the certainty of confidence that I have about the policies or the cycle of action that determines my transitions, that determines the transition from the state from the current state state and the subsequent outcomes. So that's the model. It's as simple a model as you can um, imagine. So if I now take that model and insert it into the equations that I described on the previous slide, I'm now in a position to estimate or to write down update rules, basic belief update rules, that will optimize my beliefs about the unknowns in relation to this bound of expected surprise. Uh, 
and then with the variation of the free energy. And if I do that, some very, very simple equations emerge. First of all, there are three things that we don't know. We don't know the state of the world, we don't know the policy, and we don't know the inverse, uh, the temperature, or the precision of our beliefs about the policy. So, inference in this context, or active inference in this context, simply means updating the expectations about these unknown quantities, so we can associate perception with an update uh, of this form, which actually has, I repeat, a very simple form, it's this is soft mass function of linear mixtures of expectations about the previous and subsequent states and the life of the term uh, conveyed by the observed outcomes. Action selection reduces to a classical soft mass function of the goodness of the negative goodness of positive expected to be energy, where the precision one of the three that plays the role of the soft mass parameter. And the salience or the, uh, the temperature itself, or the gamma, now takes the form of uh, an ex if you like, a prediction error um, about the expected value or uh, an free energy here of the sort that's not similar to the war prediction error. And I can just iterate these equations that will provide me with the solutions that minimize variation free energy or maximize or minimize my expected surprise. And from that, I can derive a particular um, belief about what I'm doing, select the best action, and then generate uh, a new outcome, and the cycle begin again. So let me just take you through the architecture that falls out of this sort of scheme. And I think it's interesting to know that the, the cycle of updating is a consequence of the generative model. So I'm not um, writing anything in to the scheme more than is offered by the very simple form of the generative model to which I'm applying uh, this uh, minimization of uh, uh, scheme two. So what the anatomy is, uh, uh, the anatomy that is suggested by this, um, very simply as in the form of the sensory approach, which is stating the estimation under all plausible policies. From this, we can estimate the expected free energy of each of these policies. That enables us to influence the selection uh, whilst optimizing our precision or confidence in that selection or our temperature. Remember you know, yesterday, Jill was talking about, Jill was talking about flattening representations. Uh, this flattening corresponds to that soft mass parameter of our precision. Um, having identified the best or the probability of the policies, then we can get a basic model of the next state. We then know how to act to realize that state. We can then act and solicit a new outcome from the world, and then the cycle begins again. And all that we're doing is minimizing various sorts of surprises or expected surprises. So, just to illustrate how that scheme works, I'm going to give you um, a simple example. This is a two step maze task. Um, we can argue about whether this constitutes a curious rat. I would argue it doesn't, but uh, we can talk about that later. The task is to um, locate a reward at one of the two arms and teammates here. But the agent starts in the centre and uh, can't see where the reward is. However, it does know that there's an instructional cue at the bottom arm here. So when it's blue, the reward is on this side. And it's on that side. Um, when it goes to one of the beta arms, it has to stay there, so that's an absorbent step. So it's a very simple task. You can do two movements. It can either go straight to the reward, it doesn't know where the reward is, or it can go and look at the instructional cue, like the condition statement say, and the resolve uncertainty about where the reward is, and on the second group, then that go and secure the reward. And we can write this sort of bit like problem down in terms of the parameters of that generative, uh, generative model that was described, very simply in terms of A, B, and C. The A matrix is the mapping from hidden states of the world and in two planes, where I am and the context in which I'm operating is the reward on the left and the right. And for each population uh, of hidden states, there will be a particular outcome. I happen to like uh, outcomes where I have the location where the reward is. This context or here, and the only thing that would seem better in this cost, um, the soft mass function gives me the prior preferences. So, uh, each of the power three times more 
reward to expect myself to be in a location with a reward uh, that I'm not. And um, conversely, or being in a location that's not being rewarded. Um, the B major C is again very, very simple. I can't change the context, but I can change my location. So all the B major X is doing is saying I can move to one of four places. Because there are two moves that are going to be uh, uh, ten moves, because there are two moves that are absorbing to the two arms, and the other two moves allow for uh, moving to any of the four locations. So that's the setup. This is the sort of behaviour that emerges from the setup. I've shown the behaviour here in terms of um, behaviour in the top two angles and simulated electrophysiological responses um, in the bottom two panels. Um, I'm going to ignore those at the moment because I have to uh, measure they, uh, where they came from. So this is focus on the So what I'm doing here is presenting the reward on this side and this side and this side and then repeating um, the reward presentation on the same side until the agent starts to learn that the reward's all on the same side and accumulates that knowledge in terms of uh, beliefs about the initial state, which is actually a D uh, parameter here. Um, such that as time goes on, it gets more and more confident. Thank you. It gets more and more confident about uh, uh, its behaviour. So initially, and these are the ten policies, initially it will go down and epistemically forage, find out yes, the reward is on that side, and then on the second move we'll go uh, to the reward. Um, yet later on, when its behaviour is much more confident, because it all it, uh, thinks it knows the uh, context, it will go directly to the reward side and become exploitative. So this illustrates what is uh, very characteristic to this sort of scheme. First of all, go and in, uh, harvest all the epistemic value available to you until you resolve uncertainty and there's no further information gain available. And at that point, the prior preferences, the pragmatic aspects of your behaviour kick in um, and your behaviour gracefully or transitions from being explorative to exploitative. And the reason that that works or you, that that, uh, you get that sort of behaviour for free is that when you put the utility or the pragmatics on the same, in the same currency as the epistemics, as the information game. So there is literally a value of information in exactly the same sense that any utility can be expressed in bits or nouns. Um, and by virtue of that, then there's a natural balance, I repeat, that usually ends up with, uh, first of all, limited uncertainty, and then they turn to pragmatics. Um, I'm going to wait a few minutes left, so what I've done here is um, revisit that sort of behaviour by just rehearsing the uh, and updates and noting that we can convert this into a process theory by instead of just um, solving or minimisation of our objective function here, the expected the energy, use a gradient descent. And if one does that, um, one can now start to fill in the gap in terms of predictive electric physiology. Potentials and in terms of um, changes in this decision parameter here, which look very much like uh, the sorts of responses you associate with dopamine, um, giving very um, sort of biologically plausible uh, dynamics for state estimation, or inference, poison selection, and indeed in learning every sort here uh, that one can then use to make um, predictions um, about and understand some. Empirical behaviour, uh, or example, long scientific requirements later, uh, evidence accumulation inherent in this epistemic part, the uh, divergence between chosen and unchosen options, the architecture of inferring sequential policies and uh, beliefs about the past and the future, and how that leads to a phase procession uh, and the sorts of dynamics that are in the campus. Indeed, you can get out of this uh, uh, simulation that I showed you. Basically, activity, also simulating its mathematical activities, transfer of different responses, and so on. And I want to conclude now with an example. I'm not sure we're going to have time to go through it, but I want to 
just for, because this is a fun bit, really. I want to play a game. Um, so the last simulation, which we've not enough time to go through, so we'll just play the game anyway, um, is how you learn rules, how you um, expose yourself to situations that enable you to make sense of the world. And the particular game that I'm going to make those equations uh, try to solve or uh, play uh, is this game here. And the game is as follows. There is a correct card. Um, and you have to tell me what the correct colour is by indicating uh, your choice on one of these things. It's either red, green, or blue. And I'll tell you that there is a rule. In fact, there are three rules that determine what the colour is. And your job, by trial and error, is to try and work out what the rules are. What is the correct colour for any particular pattern of stimuli here? So, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and find out how quickly you can get to the rule, and then I can see how quickly that Bayesian speed can define the rule. So, let's just start. Who wants to have a get? You would get it. What colour do you think is the, uh, is, is the correct colour in this uh, example? Blue. Blue. No, you're wrong, it was green. Do I have another go? What do you have next? Here. For the part of the first one. No, for the second one. Red. Red. No, I'm afraid it was green. No, oh right, well fortuitously then you didn't get it, so there's no point in me finishing the um, <laughs> finishing the presentation that I've got any time anyway. I'll tell you the rule. The rule was if it's green, then uh, sorry, if it's green, then it's always green. If it's blue, it's the colour on the right. And if it's um, So the colour of the centre one, I'm sorry, my point is wrong. The colour of the centre one basically tells you whether the right colour is on the right or the left. Now Lawrence, you've seen this before, you should have been, you should have been guessing, you forgot it. Huh? Anyway, that's it. Um, normally what happens is people get it by about sort of um, between 6 and 12 moves. Um, what I would have had I have time is illustrate how this speed um, solves this problem um, and solves it in about 12 rooms uh, using uh, 
what I think is probably the, the, probably the best way from the, from the perspective of this scheme to describe artificial curiosity, which is to resolve uncertainty not about hidden states in the world, but uncertainty about the parameters of the objective model, the contingencies and the likelihoods that uh, correspond to causal structure in the world. Um, and then we move on to um, consider structure learning and why um, this scheme can actually outperform um, or actually match the performance of um, some people who are able to get, it, get the rule within about f uh, five or six moves. And that basically calls upon the fact that the basic scheme that one would uh, employ without any structure learning doesn't have prior beliefs about the model space, basically know that there is a rule in place and uh, 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 discussion about what it means to know that there is a rule in place. Uh, I will then uh, try to finish on some uh, pretentious uh, quote. Well, this is what I did last night. I don't know if this is going to be useful. Um, in my world, all the terms that we were talking about yesterday have very precise um, uh, definitions and meanings. Now, that may or may not be useful. It will depend upon you being mathematically literate to enjoy or use these terms in this context. I think the more useful observation is that there are lots of names for exactly the same thing. And in terms of being able to communicate to other disciplines, other fields, it's probably uh, more useful uh, having this sort of uh, definition uh, in, in terms of understanding what you mean uh, in relation to what somebody else means. So I'll just read that there. But before I do, I should thank the people whose ideas I've been talking about and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. that 
would result in a very surprising outcome. They would just not consider it. Size is the quantity that the system is trying to minimize. To minimize, uh, I mean, as, as I understood, it is a kind of lower bound on the Bayesian surprise. What is, according to you, the, the comparative utility of this particular measure compared to other forms of measures? I think instead of the lower bound, why not the, the higher bound or the average? Why not the non Bayesian measure of surprise? Why not using prediction errors of, of neural networks who are not able to do probabilities? So what is your view on this? Um, my view is that the, the thing you actually want to minimize is the surprise or surprise of self information. Uh, literally, you're garnering evidence for your own existence. So you are a model, you have a world, you model that world, and you sample it in a way to maximize the evidence for your own existence maximizing the marginal likelihood of your construction of the world. That looks as if you're minimizing surprise, you're avoiding surprising more preferred um, uh, uncertain scenarios. So that's what we'd like to do uh, from the point of view of a uh, uh, sort of Bayesian uh, dogmatist that would be basically being fully based on talk. That's impossible. So you have to approximate Bayesian inference and you can always be cast in terms of the Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Paul.